Heroes are an inspiring group of people. Every one of them, from the larger-than-life comic book heroes you see on the big silver screen to the everyday heroes that let us live the privileged lives we do. Every hero has a story to tell. The doctor saving lives at your local hospital. The war veteran down the street who risked his lives for our freedom. The police officers and firefighters who risk their safety to ensure ours. Every hero is special and every story worth telling. But there is one class of heroes that I think is often ignored. The entrepreneur. The creator. The producer. The ones who look at the problems in this world and think to themselves, you know what? I can fix that. I can help people. And I can make a difference. Then they go out and do exactly that by creating a new product or introducing a new service. Some go on to change the world. Others make a world of difference to their customers. Welcome to The Hero Show. Join us as we pull back the masks of the world's finest heropreneurs and learn the secrets to their powers, their success, and their influence. So you can use those secrets to attract more sales, make more money, and experience more freedom in your business. I'm your host, Richard Matthews, and we are on in three, two, one. Hello, and welcome back to The Hero Show. My name is Richard Matthews. I am here today with Nathan Hirsch. Are you there, Nathan? Can we hear us? I am here. Can you hear me? I can. I got you loud and clear. Awesome. Glad to have you here. Do a quick intro here for you. I got uh, Nathan Hirsch is a serial entrepreneur, expert in remote hiring and e-commerce. You've been selling online for the last seven years and has sold well over $20 million worth of products through your e-commerce business, which is fascinating. Can't wait to hear a little bit more about that. And you're now the CEO and co-founder of FreeUp.com, hands-on um, hiring marketplace, connecting hundreds of online business owners with reliable pre-vetted remote workers, which as someone who hires remote workers, pre-vetted is huge. So look forward to hearing a little bit more about that. Um, and you're just re redefining how businesses are able to hire remote freelancers online. Um, so let's start off with basically what you're known for today, Nathan. What is it that people, when they hear the, you hear the name Nathan Hirsch, what do they, what do they think about? What, is, uh, what are you known for? I think people know me as the remote hiring guy, uh, the expert when it comes to hiring people remote, whether it's virtual assistants, freelancers, um, remote agencies. I think back in the day, people knew me as kind of a drop shipping expert back in the day when you when it was the wild wild west of e-commerce i got in a, at an early time but times have changed and now i think i'm, I'm pretty well known in the space for the, for the hiring side awesome so um i noticed you have a little bobblehead there too on your yeah. side is that of you it is when I, I took a trip to the philippines i've only been once and when i went there um they, that was the present they gave me so i keep it close to so you're desk. you're like a an actual superhero you have, yeah. once you've been made into a bobblehead that's when you know you've made it Oh my God. I, I do not consider myself a superhero for the record, but I'll go along with it for the sake of the show. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So um, let's talk a little bit about your origin story then, right? Um, we talk on the show, every hero has an origin story where you started to realize that you were different, that maybe you had superpowers, maybe you could use them to help other people. Right. Where you started to develop and discover the value that you could really bring to the world. Where did that start for you? Yeah. So when I was little, my parents were both teachers and my dad taught in the town next to me called Longmeadow. I, I lived in East Longmeadow, went to school in Longmeadow. I was able to go to that school because he taught there. And the thing about that school is every kid, their parents were doctors, lawyers, dentists, big business owners. And I wasn't poor by any means, but I was middle class. My parents were both teachers and my parents were a big fan of saving money, which was great now that they're retired. I didn't really understand that when I was a kid and, and all my friends had everything you could ever imagine. And, and I had the middle-class lifestyle. So it was never more evident than during the summers. Once I turned 15, 16, 17, my parents made me get 40 hour a week jobs. And I was inside working all day while all my friends were outside enjoying the summer. So while I was working these jobs, I learned a ton about customer service and marketing and problem solving and managing people. But I also learned that, that I was different, that I did not want to work for other people. I hated it. And I kind of looked at it as a glimpse into the real world after college of what it was going to be like. So when I got to college, I started hustling. I started trying to figure out how I can avoid going to the real world. And I started buying and selling people's textbooks, which eventually led me to amazon.com and and I started experimenting with products that, that I was familiar with, outdoor equipment, uh, sporting material, video games, and I just failed over and over and over. And it wasn't until I branched out of my comfort zone and found the baby product industry that my business really took off. So if you can imagine me as a 20-year-old single college guy selling millions of dollars of baby products on Amazon. That's that awesome. 
And I learned, I had learned so much from my internships, from my summer jobs, that my customer service was spot on. I could problem solve, I could manage people. And, and at, I guess before I was managing people, I, I met with an accountant and he said, when are you gonna hire your first person? And I kind of looked at him like, why would I do that? They're gonna steal my ideas, they're gonna not do a good job as me, it's money out of my pocket, pretty endless excuses. And he just laughed in my face and said, you're going to learn this lesson on your own. So sure enough, my, my first busy season comes around and, and I just get destroyed. I'm working 20 hours a day. My social life plummets. My, my grades go down and I make it through to January because I wasn't going to let my, my business, my baby die right then and there. I worked my butt off and I thought, man, I can never let that happen again. I need to start hiring people. So I post a job on Facebook and this guy in my business law class reaches out and says, Hey, I don't know what you do, but I need a job. Hired him on the spot, barely talked to him. And he ended up being an incredible hire. He's my business partner today. He was hardworking, he learned fast. He was passionate. So there I am as a 21 year old entrepreneur thinking, man, this hiring thing is easy. You post a job on Facebook, someone shows up, it makes your job easier. You make more money. And I proceed to just make bad hire after bad hire after bad if only hire. It always went that way, right? Exactly. And I, I quickly realized college kids, not very reliable. And I was only 21. It was really tough to hire older people to work for me. So I got thrown into the remote hiring world, the Upworks, the Fivers. And I found some good people, but it just took me forever to go through 50 applicants every time I had one job or one project or one position to fill. And and finally, I said, you know what? I, I can do this myself. I can build my own platform. And that was really the beginning of FreeUp, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. But that's how I went from a, a kid with, a, with parents who were teachers to a broke college kid to starting my Amazon business to the idea of FreeUp. Yeah, that's really cool. I know I, I started somewhere similar. I started in a, in a uh, uh, middle-class family. And I remember I got my first job at 15 at a chocolate factory and was learning how to you know peel and stick chocolates and whatnot and all this stuff. Right. And and I know, like, I knew really quickly that I was like, I am a terrible employee, <laughs> right. a terrible employee. And I hated the, uh, I hated the time and everything that my, my parents had to put into their work. And, um, I'd already started my first business on, on the side, like buying candy wholesale or wholesale at the big box stores and selling them retail at the, uh, on campus. Um, but yeah, so similar kind of thing where you like the middle-class lifestyle, you sort of, you get a really good glimpse at what, uh, high performing employees do. Um, and how much of their life it sucks away um, and how much what the lack of freedom sort of looks like um, I mean, and and there's just no creativity I mean I, I work for two corporate internships so there was no creativity there it's like you yeah. do it this way and, and I'm sure that that packaging chocolates is very similar there's there's very yeah. little room for you to bring outside information to, to change the status quo yeah so lucky for me my, my dad was in uh, was a scientist so he got to do a lot of experimentation and things like that so he, he passed a lot of that on to me which is not not everyone in the middle class you know employee lifestyle gets to do that so that was a, a benefit for me but so yeah, my dad really, was a physics teacher <laughs> oh yeah so they do the same thing every year for you know your entire career <laughs> right I mean I, I yeah it's a whole nother story my, my, my parents are, are my dad's all into science and that could not be farther from what I wanted to do with my life yeah and I remember um, learning really early that I didn't want to be defined by what I could or couldn't afford Right. I didn't want my, I didn't want, like, I don't ever ask myself that question. Can I afford this or not? It's always, you know, what do I need to do to make it so that I can have something like that in my life or whatever. I mean, you just build it. So, um, it's a very different outlook on life, but yeah. Um, love, I just love sort of how you've transitioned from, from the middle class to like starting your business to realizing like the big problem you're having in your business and you built a service that solved that problem for you. And that turns into, what it is that you guys do today with free up. So um, let's transition a little bit your superpowers, All right? What is it that you do build or offer this world that helps solve problems for other people? Um, the things that you do to slay the world, this world's villains. And I wanted you to talk specifically about what is it that free up does? Like what's the superpower? What makes you different in the marketplace? And how are you really helping entrepreneurs with this hiring scenario? Yeah, so we tried to take everything we liked about the other platforms and, and change everything that we didn't like. So we get thousands of applicants every week, virtual assistants, freelancers, agencies from all over the world. We vet them for skill, attitude, communication, top 1% get in, and then we make them available quickly to our clients whenever they need them. It, there's no browsing, you put in a request and we fill it within a business day. 
you can meet with them, make sure you like them. If you like them, you can hire them, negotiate rate, agree to fix price. If you don't like them, you click pass and provide us feedback and we get you someone else based on that feedback. So that whole process is very efficient. And then the back end, we have 24 seven support in case you have even the smallest issue. I'm very available as well. My calendar is right on the website and my team is A++ players that are, are there to help. And then lastly, we have a no turnover guarantee. People on our platform rarely quit. Of course, it's real life, it can happen. If it does, we cover replacement costs and get you a new person right away. So that's really what we're all about, our superpower, the, the free vetting, the speed, the customer service and the protection. Yeah, so one of the things that I know is really, really important is the pre-vetting because like if, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure how, how our listeners are in this space, but I know when I first got started um, hiring people, um, you'd, you know, post a job and you'd get applicants back, you'd get 15, 20, 30 people back and you'd have to like pick a few of them and like assign them like a test task that you'd pay them right. for and then like try and get stuff back to see who's communicating well and all this other stuff and like, the, for me in my business, I know one of the biggest struggles I always had was I was like, I could either do this thing myself or I could hire someone else to do it. And the amount of work that went into doing it myself versus hiring someone else to do it, doing it myself won more often than not, right? Because I could get it done cheaper and faster if I just did it myself instead of like trying to figure out how to hire someone. And you have to go through all the, the you know, finding, posting the job, hiring them, vetting them, all that stuff, um, just to get someone to the point where you're like even ready to hand off an assignment. Um, so I'm curious, tell me a little bit about how your pre-vetting works and what that means in terms of like what you're actually delivering as a, you know, in, in your, I know it's workers, but like your end result to your, to your customers. Yeah. So I really took the hire or the vetting process from my hiring process back from my Amazon business. And I learned a long time ago that if you just hire people for skill, a lot of times it doesn't work out. You hire someone with yeah. that five-star review on some platform or they have 10 years of experience and then two months later it blows up in your face and you're like, how did that happen? That, that person was so talented. So we've really found that the perfect trifecta is the skill, the attitude and the communication. So when we're dealing with skill, we don't need someone to be a 10 out of 10. They can be a eight out of 10 or a three out of 10, as long as they're honest about what they can and cannot do and they're priced accordingly. So we have skill tests and we put them through. If they're a graphic designer, we look at their portfolio. If they're an Amazon expert, we have Amazon questions. So the skill is different depending on what they're claiming that their skill is. The attitude and the communication are the same regardless. We do one-on-one -on -one interviews for attitude. We look for people who are passionate about what they do, that aren't just in it for the payment, that don't get aggressive the second that something doesn't go their way, that can take feedback and actually collaborate with people instead of taking it personally. And on the communication side, we have 15 pages of communication best practices that they have to memorize and get tested on before they get on our platform. And, and that's all stuff that I wrote myself based on my own bad communication experiences. And once someone gets on and we only let in one out of every 100 applicants onto our platform, we hold them accountable. If they're taking on projects they can't do, if we have to chase them because they're not communicating, if their attitude, if they have any attitude issues, we're very quick to remove them from our platform. And part of it kind of just self-regulates itself because they want to stay on our platform. They want to get more clients. It's, it's not worth getting through that whole process just to get removed. So that, that's really our vetting process, the skill, the attitude, and the communication. So how does that um, translate into workers? Do you have workers that are hired out like, <laughs> hourly like employee or is it more project based? How does that work? Yeah. So, I mean, we have hourly and fixed prices. The, the freelancers, they set their own rates on the platform, just like any other marketplace. So when we introduce you to someone, we'll give you a, a default hourly rate um, and you can negotiate it. You can agree to fixed price. All that is between you and the freelancer um, once we introduce you. So it, it's kind of a mixture of both. We have basic mid and expert level people on our platform. So the basic level, if you think more like virtual assistant, five to $10 an hour, non-US, they have years of experience, but they're followers. They're there to follow your system, your process. Then we have the freelancers mid-level that are 10 to 30 range, the doers, the graphic designers, the bookkeepers, the writers. You're not teaching a graphic designer how to be a graphic designer, but they're not consulting they're doers. And then we got the experts, the 20 and up, the high level freelancers, consultants, agencies that bring their own strategy, their own system, their own process. They can project manage and handle high budget. So it just depends what you're looking for, the, the basic level, mid-level, expert level. And, and depending on what it is, it could be hourly or fixed price. Awesome. That makes a lot of sense. So what I want to do is transition just a little bit. That's the superpower for like free up. 
what did you bring to the table that really made free up what it is? Like if you had a superpower yourself, Nathan. Yeah. So my two things are customer service and problem solving. I, I think that it, it's the core of, of any business of any entrepreneur. I think we live in a day and age where the companies in the world have, have gotten so big. You, you can't compete with your competitors on marketing or development, but you can always compete with them on customer service. And, and I think a lot of people miss the boat there. So for us, I mean, I, I had a ton of customer service training. It's something I valued even before that and on my Amazon business and on free up. And, and we kind of take the mentality that 99% of the time, these freelancers do a great job. My calendar or my cell phone is right on the website along with my calendar. And, and I spend very little time dealing with issues, but these are real people, real businesses, stuff happens. And, and when it does, we jump in quickly and we make sure that both sides are, are taken care of and, and are happy at the end of the day. So I would say customer service is that one superpower and then problem solving. I mean, whenever you run a startup or a business or even in life, stuff just comes up. And, and my mentality on problem solving is before you do anything, you gather all the information and then you think of different options and then you pick which option you could do and you execute it using whatever resources you have. And then that step that everyone forgets, you put steps in place to make sure that same problem doesn't happen again. And I feel like that's a competitive advantage that I've had over the years that I can problem solve at a very high level quickly and efficiently using all the resources that I have. And that's been able to have us overcome a, a lot of different obstacles that, that every entrepreneur has. Yeah. And I love, the, I love the problem solving one in particular, because problem solving is one of those things that people don't realize how high level of a skill that is. Right, because it's a, it's an innovative skill, right? It's a skill that you're not following existing systems. You're not, you you have to develop something, right? You have to look at a situation and actually like you have to bring creativity to it to, um, to solve problems. And so it's it's a it's I think it's an undervalued skill. People don't quite realize how powerful it is when you can bring someone on your team that can look at a problem and develop solutions to solve that, right? That's a hundred percent. And I think. Just like I think hiring is one of those things that if you can't hire well, eventually you're not going to be able to scale your business. I think problem solving is right there. there there's no business that just goes like this straight up. Yeah. I mean, there, there's all yeah, it's like, it's along the way. It goes all over the place. And, and you got to be able to adjust it and, and problem solve every single day. Absolutely. So the flip side of a superpower is the fatal flaw, right? Superman has his kryptonite. Um, you know, I tell people I have, uh, um, I suffer from a couple fatal flaws, but my favorite one I talk about is, uh, I, I tend to be a bit of a perfectionist, which was really hard for me on, uh, you know, hiring people. Cause I'm like, I want it to be done my specific way. And, you know, I'd spend four hours getting like one thing to go where I wanted and realize it has nothing to do with like my bottom line. Um, so I actually found that hiring people helps me overcome my own fatal flaw because then I'm not worried about the little perfection things. I'm just worried about the end result getting done. Um, so question is what would you say your fatal flaw is and what have you done in your business to help overcome that yeah i think if you can tell just by uh, talking to me for the 20 minutes we have i, I talk pretty fast i move pretty fast and and speed it is is yeah. everything to me i in my opinion i i mean it, we live in a day where things are changing every single day if you are that perfectionist and and you can't get stuff to the market quickly and and understand that things can be 85 percent of what you want to get it out there you're going to struggle and i think sometimes that can also be a kryptonite because i want to move at a million miles an hour at all times and i can't work with people that can't move at my speed and sometimes things get rushed things get out there maybe before they should so what i've done is i surround myself with people that are the exact opposite of me my business partner is slow he's meticulous He's, he's definitely more on the, the content and the writing side where I'm much more of the, the face, the sales, the customer service side. And, and because of that, we, we kind of pull each other in more to that center, more to that medium where before I'm about to send something out, he'll be like, whoa, whoa, wait, like, let's double check this. And, and let's actually look at it. Yeah, exactly. And when he's saying, hey, this is going to take two months, I'm like, no, we need, we need this in the next two weeks. And because of that, it pushes him to get stuff out there faster, which, which I think is good for business. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I found it interesting in doing interviews like this and talking to entrepreneurs, how common having a running partner or people on your team that um, that shore up your your flaws is how important that is, because the, the reality is, is we can't always just change the way we we are. Right. So you just have to bring people onto your team or bring people into your circle that can help lift up those areas and you can get like dramatically better results by just bringing in someone who's good at that thing than trying to fix it yourself. 
hundred percent. I mean, I could spend the next six months learning how to be a Facebook ad expert and I could probably figure it out. I'm a decently smart person, but that's not the best use of my time. It's way better for me to hire an expert to come in and handle it at a high level right from the beginning. And, and I also think that some people are, are just too similar to their business partners. And, and for me and Connor, we could not be more different people. We have the same core values and beliefs and we believe in customer service and treating people well and that money isn't everything and, and you give back and, and all that stuff. But in terms of skill set and personality, we could not be more different. And I think that's what makes a great partnership. It's not two people that are exactly the same working together. Yeah, I tell people uh, all the time, my, uh, my business partner is uh, the genius I keep in my back pocket and I run everything I do before him, before, before we go anywhere with it, just because I know after he looks at it, it'll be better. Right. So <laughs> that's really cool. So uh, another common thread with superheroes is having a con common enemy, right? If you could go into your client's life today and remove one thing from their life that would just make their life better. And you could just, you know, wave your magic wand and remove that completely all the way for all of your clients all the time. What would that be? I, I think people get frustrated over hiring, no matter what it is. I mean, but hiring is tough. No one has a 100% hiring record. And, and, and I hear this all the time. I think I actually made a Facebook post about this today. I had a client who said, Nate, I'm, I'm never hiring another virtual assistant again. I had this bad experience six months ago. And, and my follow-up was like, I don't know why you're on the phone with me. Like that, that's what I do. But I, I heard him through and he explained what happened and his wife made him get on the phone with me. And I said, give me a chance. And, and, he, and we turned that experience around and not that we can do that every time, but, but we're pretty good at it. And, and I think a lot of people, they, because they've had a bad experience or two, they just give up and they say, kind of like what you said before, you're like, I'll just do it myself. It's faster. It'll get done better. And, and that mentality works in the short term. It might save you a little bit of money in the short term, but long term, it doesn't make your business scalable. And I feel like a lot of people, they don't get that. And it, it's almost like, Hey, if you're, if you're working with a manufacturer and that manufacturer messes up a bunch of orders, are you just going to say, Hey, I'm never going to work with another manufacturer again. It's no, you, yeah, that's you, a learn, terrible idea. you learn from those lessons and you adjust and try to do everything possible to improve that percentage going forward. And you have to do that in all aspects of your business and hiring is no different. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's so true that you have, to, uh, you have to really get over that. Um, and I'm not sure why hiring particularly has that, that thought, but I've run into that with a lot of people where they're like, I tried to hire someone, it didn't work, so I'm never going to do it again. Right. <laughs> it's like, it like, could you imagine if you did that with all the other things in your business? Just like, I tried that Facebook post once and I didn't get a million orders, so I'm never going to post on Facebook again. <laughs> Yeah. Um, like if you just take that same logic and apply it to other things, it doesn't, it doesn't fill out really well, but for whatever reason, hiring does have that like mentality. Um, and so if you could just go out and make it so everyone, you know, all of your clients just immediately thought to themselves, I've got a problem. I need to hire out to solve it. That would be the way you would remove Definitely. is that like mental block for hiring. Cool. So next is your driving force, right? Spider-Man fights to save New York. Batman fights to save Gotham, Google fights to categorize all the world's information. What does Nathan Hirsch and freeup.com, what do you guys fight for? What's your mission? It, it's funny because if you had asked me, I don't know, eight years ago, I would have told you making money, right? I, I kind of told you my story, how I grew up in, in that middle class, always looking up and, and wanting more. And, and that got old after a while when I was running my Amazon business and I was having success. Yeah, I was making a lot of money, but who was I really helping at the end of the day? My bank account, my manufacturers, maybe yeah. my team. And, and when I started free up, it kind of opened up this whole other passion for business because I get to help business owners pursue their dreams on both sides. Freelancers are business owners and, and I get to help them. We paid out $7 million to freelancers last year and provide for their family, awesome. for their business and clients on their side, they have products or services that they're passionate about that they want the lifestyle. And I get to be a small part of helping them achieve that. So for me, that's my why I, I want to grow free up. So it's a win for everyone across the board and, and people get to, to scale and pursue whatever they want to do with their business. And, and for me, that's what it's all about. Yeah. I love that. It's really, it's, it's a win, 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 right? Where everyone in the transaction is getting something of value from it. And that's one of my favorite things that I've um, over the last 10 years that I've been hiring people. Um, I actually, I've had a couple of people that I've worked with for years now. Um, and I know one of them um, we've been, we've been chatting for a while and it's like, we, he talked to me the other day and he was like, I just wanted to, you know, thank you for having me on your, you know, it's just part-time work, but on your team all the time, it's like, you've enabled me to keep my mom at home and help raise my sister and all these other things. And it's like, that's, 
that's like a real legitimate impact I'm having in his life. And he's been helping me build my business on the same, same token. And like every person that you hire has different stories like that, but there's, there's, there's some real life, some like real grit that goes into, uh, to hiring and working with people. 100% agree. I mean, it, it, it's super rewarding. I, I mentioned the, the client before that was like, I'm never hiring a VA again. And, and I check in and he's got four VAs that are crushing it and his business is going well. And I mean, th that's what, it, what it's all about. And, and yeah, it, it's cool running into someone at a conference. I, I was just at a conference and I had a freelancer that was on my platform come up to me and I had a client that was like, Hey, I know you, I see your picture. I use your service. Like that, that's cool to me. Yeah. And I know, like, I just, I just brought on my first uh, full-time, like, staff. Um, most of my staff for the last, you know, number of years had always been part-time or project-based. And I brought on my first full-time person. And since doing that, I've, like, doubled my business. So, like, if you're out there and you're thinking, I need to hire someone, absolutely do it. Especially if you're, uh, you've got systems and whatnot to follow. It's really helpful. 100%. So, next question. This is more practical, right? It's your hero's tool belt, right? You know, maybe you have a big magical hammer like Thor or a bulletproof vest like your neighborhood police <laughs> officer. Um, maybe you just really love how Evernote helps you uh, solve, you know, put all your notes together and thoughts and whatnot. Do you have any tools that you use on a daily basis that really help you accomplish what you accomplish with your business? Yeah, I mean, I use Skype, I use Trello. I keep it super simple. I, I manage 50 people just using Skype and, and Skype group chats. I use Trello for projects, dividing up short-term and long-term. I use Jira for developers, for whatever reason, they like organizing stuff um, in that software. I use Google Docs and, and I use Gmail. And, and I'm a big fan of just practicing what I preach, that you don't need all these huge, expensive, clunky softwares to manage a lot of people if you do it right. I mean, you can, I have clients that do, but. For me, I, I keep it simple and we're very efficient and I, I would put our organization against anyone. That's awesome. Yeah, I love I love Trello in particular. I've been using Trello for my team for a number of years. And like we have uh, so many things that you can automate between Trello and Google Drive with like Zapier. I've got stuff nowadays that like will to record a process document, it'll drop into a Google Drive folder and Zapier will pick that up and make a Trello card for it and assign it to someone and then you can follow nice. it through its whole progress and it's like it's like all hands off and you can really keep track of projects and whatnot. And the damn thing's free. Like, you know, we don't spend any money on Trello and right. we can manage like really complex processes with it. Um, so and I can imagine, you know, I've only got one or two people any game time. You, you manage 50 people with Trello. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> How many uh, Trello boards do you have? Um, so I have mine, which is like my projects, but my assistants are, are involved in them. And then my assistants have their own board. Okay, so you've got just a couple of boards that you manage everything in? Yep. Cool. Yeah, so um, I really like that. Um, it's really great to keep your, uh, your business organized with, uh, with Trello. Next question is your personal heroes, right? So Frodo had Gandalf, Luke had Obi-Wan, Robert Kiyosaki is Rich Dad. Who are some of your heroes? Were they real life mentors? Were they speakers or authors? Were they peers who were just a few years ahead of you? And how important were they to what you've accomplished so far in your business? So the one person that I've always looked up to is my aunt, Christine. I mean, when I was, so I was this college kid, I went to school, I got a degree. My parents are both teachers, right? So education is important. And when I got to the end of college, I had a, a big decision to make. It was, do I keep doing this Amazon entrepreneur thing, the wild, wild west, or, or do I take the safe route and I have some job offers and, and do I take them? And, and I remember sitting down with her multiple times, just hearing her out, her life as an entrepreneur, the ups and downs, and she didn't pressure me one way or the other. And my parents didn't really either, but I could tell that they were leaning way more on the security and the, the taking. Yeah. The so, I, I mean, for me, I I'll always just look up to her. I, I learned so much just about being an entrepreneur and pursuing your passion. And without that conversation and that support, I, I don't think I'd be where I, where I am today. Yeah. That's awesome that you had, you had an entrepreneur really look up to you and like, and bounce your ideas off of, I know I didn't really have that. Um, uh, and when I, I actually dropped out of college, um, about three and a half years in, I only had six months left to get a bachelor's degree. And I was like, I'm actually done. Like I got what I wanted out of my college career okay. and I'm going to go and do business now, which I remember my, my dad and my mom at the time were like, are you crazy? Like first you went to this college that we don't understand why you went to. And then you get, you know, 95% <laughs> you know, of the way through and then you quit. And I was like, well, I got what I wanted out of school. And then I, I left when I was done and started my, started my, uh, consulting practice that I run now. Um, that was, you know, a long time ago, 2007 time frame, And, um, it's been, uh, it's been a really amazing journey. And I just, um, I love that you had someone to sort of like bounce that off of. Cause I, when, when I did that, I was just like, Oh God, what I'm going to do. Right? <laughs> jump, right. Jump off the deep end and see how it goes. 
Um, so that's really cool. Um, so, um. Are you tired of trying to write webinars that don't consistently convert? How would you like to have a webinar that effortlessly created sales in your online business? You can. Introducing the Webinar Alchemy Workshop. Webinar Alchemy Workshop is an online masterclass that will help you write incredibly persuasive webinars for your online courses quickly and easily. Using what you learn in this class, you can build a webinar that educates your entire audience while still creating sales. For a limited time, you can purchase this masterclass for only $7, and you'll get the exact framework I've personally used to help my clients sell more than a million dollars worth of online coaching and training just over the last year. Simply text the word ALCHEMY, A-L-C-H-E-M-Y, to 444-999, and I'll send you all the details. The music is by Purple Planet Music. Visit www.purple-planet.com. Um, so, uh, last question we have for the show is your guiding principles, right? So, what are the top one or two principles or actions that you regularly, um, you use regularly today that contribute to the success and influence that you enjoy? Um, and maybe, more specifically, ones that you wish you had when you started. Yeah, I mean, th- my core principles are, are somewhat straightforward. I, I don't screw people over. That's principle one. If I, if I do something, it, it's to benefit the, the people around me and to be fair and to make sure people are taken care of. And, and off of that, I mean, it, it, if, something is, if something does go wrong, I take responsibility for it and I figure out whatever I need to do to fix it because we're all human. We all make mistakes. Even things that are inside your control or outside your control. If it's part of your business, it's your responsibility to, to your community. So my mentality is to take responsibility and to fix it. Um, I, I mentioned customer support and making sure that you're there for people and that you never get you never get too big to, to talk to your customers or your client base or, or even people that just follow you that, that watch our YouTube videos. You're you're not above them. You're, you're not below them. You're, you're just people just like them and to always find time for other people and to, con- to continue to give back and just treating people well across the board, whether it's your team, your clients, your partners. And, and lastly, just if you say you're going to do something, you just do it. No excuses. No, no, no if, ands, or buts. Don't commit to something unless you can 100% do it. And I, I preach that across my team and everything else. So I want to comment on the second one you, t- you mentioned, because I think a lot of people who are in your position where you've gotten to, you know, 10, 20, 30 million, and, you know, many people on your team, they think that they are bigger than their customers or don't have time for their customers, things like that. And I'm just curious, how does that actually play out in your business? You know, as you scale and you get more customers and you get those things, you know, I know Tim Cook is famous for responding to customer letters and stuff like that. How does it actually work in reality when you get to have the size business that you have that, you know, can you actually take the time to be personally involved with customers and followers? Yeah. So great question. And I actually, I have a Facebook post. I don't think I I posted it up yet, but I mean, I had a client that called me out on that. They're like, Nate, I I don't believe that you're running a big business. Like how can you put your phone number on the website? And and people have been telling me I'm crazy for that forever, but here, here's the real truth behind it. First of all, I have a rock star team that I spent a lot of time investing, onboarding, training, getting them up to where they can handle 95% of the situations. And the average client is respectful. They, 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 they're not calling me every day, just bothering me for small stuff. They know when to go to me. They know when to go to my team. And, and I also really believe in the free up concept. If, if we're giving out bad freelancers and yeah, my phone's going to blow up, but that, that kind of goes against everything that, that we believe in. And if my phone is blowing up and I send someone a freelancer and, and they're coming to me that over and over that freelancer is not getting more clients from us. We're, we're cutting them off. So Part of it really regulates yourself. If I ever had a client that was just calling me every Saturday night and just overdoing it, I would take a step back and reset those expectations. But that, that's never really happened. And I almost related to uh, my girlfriend got her teeth pulled out and the dentist gave out his card with his cell phone number. And I thought it was genius. It, it's personally, it's keeping you personally involved. Hey, if you ever have an emergency, like this is my number, feel free to call me at any time. But the thing is, people don't have those emergencies. He's really good at what he does. And yes, if something does come up, he wants to be able to, to handle it. But 99.9% of the time, they call the office, they talk to his assistants, and, and that resolves almost everything. So that's kind of the mentality that I have. And if we grow to a certain level, maybe I have to take my phone number off. Maybe I have to remove my calendar. But I'm kind of excited to see how far we can push this thing without having to do that. Yeah, I really like that. And I like that, uh, that you've sort of you've built the systems in place that, you can be available, right? You have, you have your team handling so much of your stuff that, you know, if you, you want to take a time for one of your clients, you can, right? Um, so you, you've built your business with that in mind. 
um, which I think is important. Uh, and I know a lot of businesses, they try to, you know, have like this level of separation between them and them, their clients or whatever. Um, and I know I've like, I've spoken to a few clients that are like, I feel like I need to be farther away so that they'll appreciate my, my rates more. And I'm like, I, I don't know if I agree with that. So I don't agree right. with that, but there's a lot of people way smarter than me that have way bigger businesses that probably disagree with different things that I do. Yeah. Yeah. That's the way that goes. So last part of the show, we do this with every, uh, everyone who comes on, I call it the hero challenge and the hero challenge is simple. And do you have someone in your network that you think has a great story that should be told? Who is it? And why do you think they should come on the show? Oh, um, someone who has a great story that I think should be told. Um, there's this guy I really look up to in the space, uh, space, um, Seth Knip, which I'm definitely butchering his last name. <laughs> and I've talked to him a few times, um, but he has an incredible story about how he went from homeless and to having one dime to his name and his community is called just one dime and how he, he has now built a, a large e-commerce business. He has a community where he gives back and helps other people build businesses. For me, I always, I just think that's really cool. I mean, I've never been in a position where I was down to my last dollar, my last dime. And, and for someone to get to that point and then to work their way back, back up, that's way cooler than anything I've ever done. Yeah, that's super awesome. I know like, uh, um, I, I always, I never always relate to the people who've had the the rags to riches stories because I was like I was never in rags, right? I grew right. up a middle class family, uh, but it's super cool to see that people have that ability, especially today. And you know, we we just have such a cool free like so much freedom available to us that uh, you know if you really put your mind to it, you can do whatever you want. So what was his name again? Seth Knip. Seth K Knip. Okay, cool. K N I E P. I think. Awesome. So we'll, we'll look him up and, uh, and see if we can uh, get him on the show later. Um, last thing is, thanks for being on the show, Nathan. Where can people find you if they want to hire people and maybe learn a little bit about hiring people? Um, and better question, when should they start looking to hire someone in their business? If you could give a, you know, some, some feedback on if someone's thinking, do I need to hire someone? What would you tell them? Yeah. So for years, I dodged that question because I try to not take the approach of like, you need to hire someone right now. That's not really how I do things. Um, but what I did was I took a step back and I thought, how do I decide when it's time to hire? And I look at how much money we made last month and I figure out how aggressive do I want to be? Do I want to invest 40 to 60% of my profits back in my business? Very aggressive or 10 to 30%. And there's no right or wrong answer. Everyone's at a different point of their life and their business, but figure out what that number is and then figure out how you're going to invest that money. Is it the basic level followers, the mid-level doers, or, or the high level experts? And that's the best answer I can give on when that right time is. If you can come up with that percentage and then figure out what you can invest and actually afford someone, to me, that's the right time. Um, in terms of how people can find me, the free up blog, the free up YouTube channel, we're launching a podcast called Outsourcing and Scaling. I'm really excited about. And if you go to freeup.com with three E's, my calendar is right at the top. You can book a free meeting with me and you can mention this podcast for a $25 credit to try us out. Awesome. Thank you very much for coming on. We really appreciate it, Nathan. Um, and if you haven't hired someone in your business yet, I can tell just from personal experience that hiring someone, particularly when you get out of some of the project based stuff into like really having staff on your, on your, um, your business, it really helps you take everything you're doing to the next level. Um, so definitely check out Nathan and freeup.com. I, um, I, I can't stress enough how important the, pre-vetting that his company does for VAs will make your life so much easier um, if you get into hiring freelancers. Again, thank you, Nathan, for coming on. And we'll, uh, um, I'll let you know when, uh, when we get this all published for everyone. Sounds great. Have a good rest of the day. You too.